please. Dewey, Peter. Yeah, ah, okay. Alright, so this is all joint work of Tafana Ziegler that we'll be talking about. Um, and I talked about this in, in Norway a few weeks ago, so those of you who are there, I apologize for the repetition of materials. Um, slightly different. You know, Okay, so um, um, we did, uh, our goal was to um, include the class of results which we call concatenation results, uh, where you have sort of structure in one direction and structure in another direction. You want to concatenate the two structures and get structure in a, in a joint direction. Um, and so to illustrate, illustrate what I mean by this, I'll, I'll give a simple algebraic example. So without any ergodic theory of common toys. <coughs> So uh, let's let's take two um, um, abelian groups, additive groups. So the algebraic, so I don't care the infinite or finite, whatever. Um, <coughs> and I have a function. I want this group. This group, uh, we can define derivatives. So if you take any shift in your group, you can define um, the shift of f uh, to be uh, or derivative, if you like. So the derivative is just. Uh, Difference operator applied uh, in the direction h. Um, and so I can make a definition um, that if, uh, if h is a subgroup of g and uh, d is just some natural number, uh, we say that, um, and, and uh, we say that we call the function p from g to a polynomial. Minus p <coughs> uh, along h. Um, if well, polynomials degree of d, if uh, they vanish, you differentiate them d plus one times. So if whenever you differentiate polynomial d plus one times, you vanish as long as x is in your domain, and you only differentiate in the directions h. So this is a definition. So to give an example. Um, so, for example, if G is the lattice of C2 and H is uh, the horizontal, so you have H is the horizontal subgroup of, of C2, um, and A is anything, I don't care. Um, so, um, a function from C2 now to A is it? So one, so it's linear. Uh, along h1, along h, you yeah, know, h1. Uh, if, it, if it takes the form uh, p of uh, nm is um, it can be written in this form. So, so for, for every fixed m, so for every horizontal line, it, it, is, it is a linear function in n for fixed m. Okay, so, so you can see that if it's of this form, if you differentiate twice, take difference of this twice in the horizontal direction, you, you get zero. And conversely, it's not hard to show that, that if a function has, to, um, has a second difference of zero in every horizontal direction, then it must be this form. Okay, but A and B, a and B can be arbitrary functions of M, so you only, have, you only have structure in the horizontal direction, you have no structure in the vertical direction. Okay, um, and then of course, uh, completely analogously, oops, you have the vertical line saying that you're linear in, in H2 means that you have a representation of the form, let's say, C of n m plus P of n. Okay, so being, being linear in the vertical direction means that you, you, you have a structure like this. Um, and then finally, um, being of degree C2 along the whole group, uh, along all of G. Um, what that means is that you're a quadratic polynomial. Let's say A is too divisible. A is really the binomial coefficients, if not, but okay, uh, plus, uh, I don't know. Uh, okay, um, all right, so, um, yeah, okay, so this is what it means to be a degree two. Okay, and so the, um, the concatenation theorems that we, are, we want to, to prove are, are, things, uh, are statements of the form that, that if you have structure along two different directions, like H1 and H2, you can combine them and get, and get structure in. in Direction. So it's actually a nice exercise to show that if a function p is linear in n and is linear in m, 
then it actually must be quadratic and jointly. And, and, and so, uh, in fact, you can show that if, if P is of, of both these forms are simultaneously, then P must actually, um, I cannot quite figure this form, but it could just be of. Uh, um, the only functions that are linear in N for fixed M and linear in M for fixed N are functions which are so bilinear in N and M in, 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 in the sort of affine sense. Okay. Um, so this is actually a much more general. Statement. This is a special case for general statement. An easy algebraic fact. Okay, so you take any two affiliate groups. Um, you take two subgroups, um, and I take a function, uh, let's say p, from p to a. Uh, and I need two natural numbers. Um, okay, and so uh, and so uh, the statement is that if uh, P is a is a is polynomial of degree and then P one or H one and P is polynomial of degree and D two. Necessarily of top polynomial degree, the concatenated degree d1 plus d2, along the concatenated degree d1 plus h2. Okay, so we can combine structure in these two directions, uh, but again, you have to pay a price that the, the degree of your structure goes up um, when, uh, when you do it. Okay, so this is the case one and one and two, one plus one equals two. So this is not how to prove, so it's, uh, let, me, let me show you how it's proven. Uh, you prove it by induction on, let's say, the sum of d1 and d2. Okay, so it, uh, the claim is easy if one of them vanishes. For example, if d2 vanishes, if p is a polynomial degree 0 along h2, well, that means that p is h2 invariant. And then you sort of just quotient H2 out, and then it's so clear that being polynomial degree D1 along H1 is equivalent to being polynomial degree D1 along H1 plus H2. So, um, so these are easy. Um, so uh, you assume instead that D1 and D2 are bigger than 1, uh, and that you prove it at all smaller, like put, uh, smaller values of D1 plus D2. Um, so now what you do is that uh, you, you start taking care of it. So uh, you, 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 you pick an element in H1, you pick an element in H2. Um, okay, so uh, you take your function and you shift it in the h1 direction. So by definition, that's your return function plus <coughs> your first derivative as the h1 derivative of p. Okay, so if you shift in the h1 direction, okay, so basically this contains a little picture which you'll, you'll see. It's not a very deep picture. Okay, so I kind of like this. It's not an L shape. So um, p at, the p of L at x plus h1 differs from p of x plus by this derivative. Now, um, p was of degree uh, d1 along h1, so we differentiate it once in each one direction. This is of degree d1 minus 1 along h1. So differential polynomial degree d, you get polynomial degree d minus 1. Um, along h2, um, it was a polynomial of d2 uh, along h2, and it will still be a polynomial of degree d2 along h2. So you can make some stuff like that. So by induction, you can concatenate the, um, these things. So you know that, that this guy is, if by induction, is some degree equals d1 plus d2 minus 1 along h1 plus h2. So you concatenate these two facts, you know about this derivative, and you, you, you already have a lower degree uh, control of your function in, in the joint direction. Um, and similarly, p of um, x plus h1 plus h2 with x plus h1, so now I'm going to go from here up to here. Uh, this, is, this, this differs by h2 derivative of p shifted by h1. And, but the, the shift doesn't change much of anything. This guy is also of, uh, by the same argument uh, of degree d1 plus d2 minus 1 along h1 plus h2. And so therefore, you, you, you concatenate these two equations. Um, and what you find okay, is that, um, is that uh, p of x at h1 plus h2 differs from p of x plus 
um, something which is a, a which is a degree uh, which is a degree d plus d two minus one. I want to make one of these two, just the sum of these two uh, derivatives. Okay. Um, okay. We're basically using the, the, the direction derivative, just the sum of the two partial derivatives. Okay. Um, and so what this tells you is that the derivative of, of x in the, along the direction of h one plus h two is of degree d one plus d two minus one in the h one position direction, and this implies that degree of degree d one plus d two. Okay. So um, yeah, the proof is basically this triangle in, in some sense. Okay, and so you sort of uh, follow your notes with that. Okay. Um, so I can um, uh, let me give you a variant of this actually. So um, there's, there's a variant of this for commuting shifts in some sense, the, the, these, where you don't differentiate in the same direction again and again, you differentiate in different directions. Um, so maybe I, uh, let me just mention this. I, I won't say much about it more, but um, you can. There's a variant of this lemma where you don't differentiate in the same direction. So um, suppose now you have an integer d <coughs> and you have um, Many different subgroups of G, and you have a function section and G just matter the group. Um, let's say that P is of type rank subgroup, so of rank less than H1 HD, which is a strange notation, but uh, it's, it's rank less than H1 HD. If whenever you differentiate once in each one direction, once in each two direction, once in each D direction, you vanish. This is a funny concept. Let's show you some examples. Um, so uh, if, if G is Z2 again, uh, and H1 is the vertical line, sorry, horizontal line, and H2 is the vertical line, um, saying that P is of rank uh, less than horizontal vertical, um, what that means is that P It's a, what we call a right one function. It's the sum of a, of a function of just of the first variable plus a function of the second variable. Okay, because those are the functions where you differentiate once in the vertical direction and once in the horizontal direction, you get zero. Um, if instead uh, g was c3 and you took um, the three different uh, coordinate lines, um, then saying that you are rank less than those three lines. So you, uh, you can generalize it. If all the edges are the same, this collapses to the previous notion of polynomiality. But it, it's also, so it sort of interpolates between. between and if you would tell H i is to be a two-dimensional, to be a L plus B a K plus C. Uh, no, uh, it's something else, which I don't quite know what it is. Uh, it should be criterion for linear, sum of linear ones. So uh, um, parameter. Yeah, yeah, I can't do this in my head right now. Uh, it is, you can write down what it means. Uh, it might, uh, uh, I'm not sure it's exactly that. Um, okay, I have to think about it, yeah, okay. Um, right, so yeah, but it, it does capture various kinds of, of representations of, 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 of P, so being polynomial in certain senses or constant in certain senses, or whatever. Um, and so there's a similar theorem that if you, if you have, um, a whole bunch of subgroups h1 up to h d1 and k1 up to kd2. If you have a whole bunch of subgroups like this uh, and you have a function, and suppose that you have you control the rank, so if, if p is of rank at most uh, less than h1 hd1 and of rank less than k1 kd2, if you have um, two different controls on the rank, then you, you can con concatenate this and you can conclude that P is of rank less than, what you do is that you take all possible sums 
of one, uh, one group here and one group here. So from I equals 1 to D1, and J equals 1 to D2. And so you have D1, D2 diff uh, different groups here, and you see the piece of rank uh, by, by that. Uh, so, so here's it's slightly different. So in the first compression, so the degree of the concatenated structure was the sum of the degrees of the <coughs> here. Uh, uh, once you have uh, commuting shifts, it's actually the product rather than the sum. Um, uh, but, um, but you prove this by basically the same technique. That, uh, Okay, so I just want to mention uh, this, this variant. Okay, but that's all I'll say about this variant uh, for now. Okay, so uh, what we were interested in um, uh, is trying to prove analogs of this concatenation phenomenon in the setting uh, either of ergodic theory of characteristic factors or um, combinatorially using the uh, Gauss norms. Um, so the results are easier to state uh, in, in the ergodic setting. Um, and, Large fraction of people who have got to do, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll say things publicly. Okay, so um, okay, so we'll take a, a carnival meeting, a carnival meeting um, and a group. Okay, um, and uh, it's going to act on some measure preserving system. Uh, so it's going to act measure preservingly on a probability space, so we have all these shifts to your G. Observing for all G and G, which um, form a representation. Okay, um, so then we can define um, these semi norms. Okay, so I'm what I call um, also it's semi norms. Um, and I'll define them uh, in local directions. So I'm also going to need a subgroup. So I think a subgroup of, of H along G. Um, Oh, and, um, and I'm not assuming this system is ergodic, uh, which is important because uh, even though it was ergodic, if it was ergodic in, in, along the, uh, sort of the G action, it's not necessarily ergodic in respect, respect to the subgroup actions. And so you have to not use ergodicity in this, uh, if, if, if at all possible. Uh, um, uh, so, okay, so, uh, yeah, so I'm very deliberately not assuming ergodicity here. Um, okay, so, um, I'll try to find that step. So, so given a function, I say, a uh, bounded function, Function um, and some d rather uh, than one, uh, we can define the class semi norm d of x along h by this the power. And what this is, uh, and just, um, so uh, uh, let's, just, let's just say that you're real, so not like conjugation signs anywhere, uh, h1 up to hd in the Hamer set. Um, okay, and then integral of x, big product uh, over q, um, okay, so uh, shift of h1 integral 1 so h d omega d, the function, and then we call that as your measure. Uh, okay, yeah, so, so uh, this is a formal sequence uh, for this, uh, this group h. Right? So, kind of all adult groups are always amenable. So there's, there's some homo sequence, it doesn't matter which one, um, as it turns out. And um, uh, okay, so you, you take H1, H2, HD in some big um, sort of chunk of all, finite chunk of H, and then you, you average over all parallel pi pairs of um, in uh, um, cubes, I guess, okay, in, in uh, yeah, so, so the, the, the picture is that you have this X and you have this H action, which maybe is, is not a god X, so maybe it's only acting in some sort of horizontal direction. And so you, you're, you're taking some suitable Parallel ground parallel pi pair. Um, you're looking at all the sort of the, the, the parallel pi pairs um, along the h direction, and you're averaging the product of f in those directions, then you integrate. And that gives you um, this this uh, this quantity, uh, these Gauss holds semi norms, uh, which happen to in fact actually be semi norms. Um, and sometimes they're zero, sometimes they're not zero. Um, so yeah, just oh, okay. Not quite half the original little stuff already, but uh, um, just 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 give one example. Um, uh, how many? Uh, no, it's not the example yet. Okay. Um, okay. So sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's not zero. But uh, um, a nice fact is is that uh, you can just you can sort of describe where this, these forms vanish and where they don't vanish in terms of characteristic factor. So there's a fairly easy fact. 
uh, which is that uh, there exists a factor. Uh, let's see, uh, let's go to two minus one. So uh, a factor, so what that means is that there's, 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 uh, there's some factor map. So this is again a G system, this is a G system, and, and there's, there's a projection map from, um, from here to here, which, which preserves the measure and preserves the action, uh, this, um, which in particular means that uh, anything that's bounded over here embeds back into the bounded function up, up, upstairs. Okay, so there's a factor here which is called the, 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 uh, the universal characteristic factor, um, such that all functions which are bounded, um, your sum rule vanishes. It can only if uh, you're orthogonal to this factor. That it can meet the conditional expectation of it with respect to this factor. It's zero. Okay, so if, if, if you're orthogonal to everybody in here, then your, your Gauss norm vanishes, and if you're not, you, your Gauss norm doesn't vanish. Um, okay, so there's always this, uh, uh, this factor, um, and it, 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 it's, it's different for different D and, 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 and H. Um, so, for example, uh, you can check that, uh, that the zero factor, for example, is the, um, is the H ergodic component of, uh, of X. So it's, it's, all, it's all the functions. So the, the functions that are measurable with respect to this factor are the functions which, which are which, um, uh, which are in, which are invariant in each direction, which may or may not be, be, be trivial, depending on how how you are. Um, see, one of x, see, one of h of x is, is the conical factor along h. Um, if the action of h is ergodic, this you can describe this factor as as being generated by the h eigenfunctions, the eigenfunctions of the h action. Um, if it's not ergodic, you can either split into ergodic components and have eigenfunctions in each component, um, or you can talk about sort of relative eigenfunctions, uh, so functions that are, um, so an, an eigenfunction would be something, okay, so an, an eigenfunction of the uh, H action is, is a function, so whenever you shift it, it's a, it's, it's a multiple of your function by some scalar uh, H, but um, uh, the H, if the action is not ergodic, the correct notion is sort of a relative eigenfunction, where, um, which is a function which, which, when you shift it, is equal to f times a function which is which is not constant anymore, which is h invariant, okay, and that was sort of relative uh, each function, and that generates the conical factor, and, and that's the right factor for, for u two h, um, and then it gets worse. From then on, uh, I mean, it's much more complicated. Um, okay, yeah, so um, right, so this uh, this is called the Kra, uh, where if, if h is like a lattice, like z or, or z squared or z to d. You can describe um, these types of factors in terms of inner systems and no systems. Um, for other H, it's a little bit different. Um, like if, if, if H is, is the, uh, um, is for example, an infinite vector space of a finite field, um, then there's a slightly different characterization of higher order polynomials, which I won't get into. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, you can sort of start classifying or describing what, what these higher ones look like, um, but it's kind of difficult to do so, and we won't actually. Uh, need those classifications for what I'm saying. Okay, so now we can save our main concatenation theorem. Okay, so uh, okay, so we, we have we have a measure observing system uh, and you have two subgroups of your action and you have two degrees. Zero, okay, and your function. Okay, so if your function has, so our statements, if your function has structure along each one direction, and that if measurable with respect to the um, d1, um, so if it lies in the uh, d1 minus one factor, um, so it's so thought it's 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 anti uh, uh, UD uniform. Um, which is the analog of being, uh, like a polynomial of, of degree d1 along h1, and if it's also a polynomial, well, if it's structured of degree d2 along h2, then um, we are necessarily um, a polynomial of degree, uh, uh, so you're structured of, of, of degree d1 plus d2 along the joint direction. 
direction. So this is the analog of the algebraic limit. Again, so let me just give you an example. Okay, so take C2, and H1 is the horizontal line, and she's the vertical line. Um, X is going to be a free torus with high measure. Uh, and our shifts, uh, okay, so uh, if you uh, so um, if you shift in the good, in the horizontal generator of x, y, z, uh, what we do is that we shift x, uh, shift x by uh, some irrational alpha, pick your favorite irrational root 2, uh, y, z plus y. So uh, you shift uh, in this direction, you don't do anything here, uh, and you shift in the z direction. And the generator over here um, it's like this. Okay, so this is sort of a two-dimensional skew shift type, type sort of system. Um, and you can verify these leases commute, so they actually do give you a z direction. Okay, so um, the thing is that if you just look in the horizontal direction, um, this system is not ergodic because it's not moving the y around. So um, this system splits into ergodic components every time you fix y. Uh, you, uh, you get basically, well, uh, let's say, an irrational y. Uh, you, you, you get an ergodic component of, of the system. And once you fix y, this is, this is just a, a, a small uh, shift, a circle shift, a, a shift on the torus, two torus. So um, your system is already of order one. Um, it's, 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 a conic, it's, 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 it's in the conical factor um, with respect to the horizontal action. And it's still in the, in the conical act with respect to the, uh, the vertical action. But jointly, it is a two step system. Systems. Um, so you have conical behavior in, in a vertical direction and horizontal direction, and you, you can concatenate that to conclude that you have two step behavior in, in, in one direction. So that's an example of this thing in action. And there's an analogous statement where you have commuting shifts rather than, than a single shift, uh, analogous to the, the other proposition I stated, which I'll stop on. Okay, um, so uh, I want to talk about a little bit about the proof of this theorem and then why we care. Why we wanted this theorem. Um, okay, so uh, well, the proof first. So we, we have two proofs of, of this of this result. Um, there's, there's, there's a combinatorial proof. Um, using something that I introduced a few years ago called, called uh, Newton Newell's pure weakness. It's the main tool. Um, okay, it doesn't work for completely all H1 and H2 for, for a stupid reason. It only works for H1 and H2, which are either uh, finitely generated or um, proof finite or the, uh, the sum of a proof finite group <coughs> and a finitely generated group. But that covers almost all cases that we care about. Um, okay, yeah, so there's, there's some technical restrictions, but it's a combinatorial proof. So there's a, there's a combinatorial version of this, uh, uh, which I won't write down because it's, it's, uh, it's much, many more epsilons. <laughs> okay. uh, but uh, you prove that first, and then there's a way to take a limit and prove the ergodic theory version. Uh, <coughs> there's an ergodic theory proof. <coughs> Uh, using very much the uh, machinery in the original paper of Austin Traub, uh, where they characterize practice factors of, of C actions. Um, um, basically, lots and lots of chronology of course cycles. Okay. Um, so, I think I won't talk so much about either of these proofs, but I'll just mention. Um, so, yeah, in, in Norway, I talked a little bit about, about the combinatorial proof. Uh, we didn't quite have the got a proof group there, now we have it. Um, but um, I'll just mention one ingredient uh, that goes in to the uh, I've got a good proof uh, which, which, which reflects this triangle, which is, uh, which is a bit, uh, you need to have this triangle somewhere in your proof, um, uh, implicitly. Okay. So, um, yeah, given this, uh, 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 so whenever you have a subgroup H uh, um, um, of the G action, uh, you can define these, these, these higher order uh, um, Q spaces, okay, and, and, the, and the simplest one is, is the first one, X1 of H, um, along H. Which you can define either it's it's, it's the leveraged product of x along the h invariant factor, um, or another way of thinking about it is that uh, you, you you take uh, this space x, um, take x and you shift it by some element um, in the h direction, and you have these sort of line segments, and you take sort of the natural measure. So 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 this space as a set is just x squared uh, with a certain measure. Uh, and the measure is the natural measure associated to, to, to these pairs. Um, 
So every time you have a function of two variables, you know, integrate it against this measure, uh, what, uh, what it is, is just the limit on the component sequence, average h in that component sequence, component sequence of h, uh, of the integral of uh, f of x, uh, comma th. that you should think about as a space of all uh, line segments that are parallel to H. So if H is some sort of horizontal action, then it should be some horizontal line segments. Okay. And if H is vertical, it should be some sort of vertical line segments. Okay. And so, um, right, so if you vary H, you get, you get all the different spaces. So, so, X, so, so if you get two different groups, H1 and H2, then the, uh, the X1 space over H1 is, is some um, motion observing system, and H1 H2 is a very different measure observing system, so that would be the space of all vertical line segments in some sense. Uh, and then there's, there's also H X1 of the joint action, and that corresponds to sort of line segments that, that, that are not constrained to vertical or horizontal, but some combination of, of the three. So these three guys are not obviously related to each other, they're not, uh, they're not factors of each other or anything. But um, the great thing is that there's a, there's a common space called the L-shaped space. Of basically, shapes that looks like this, um, such that all these three guys are factors of a single space. Um, so, uh, roughly speaking, what you do is that you just, you just take a well, point and, and you shift it by some element in h1 direction, and you shift that by an element in h2 direction. And your h1 and h2 variable will form a sequence of h1 and h2, and, and you, t you take a weak limit, and this will give you some measure on x3. Um, and it will give you basically a, a, a public distribution <coughs> on these sort of L shapes type, type objects. And then if you delete one of the, of the three elements of your triangle, you get back, you get, it turns out you get back to five, maybe each of these three, three spaces. And, and this is the link. So, um, yeah, the, the way we prove it, we prove this theorem is that uh, eventually, by using all this whole machinery, that, that this, uh, you get these, these co boundaries on, on these two spaces, and you can pull them back up to be co boundaries over here, and then you can mop them together. So, you um, cancel off this, this vertex, and then you try to push it back down to the co boundary over here. Um, so there's, there's some basically the, the co-cycles on, on these three on these three spaces talk to each other through this space, and that is uh, that plus a lot of machinery from Hosenkra is how uh, <coughs> lets you prove uh, 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 this theorem. Okay. All right. Um, but that's I think all I say about the, the proof. Um, yeah, but in some sense, uh, that what I just said is the analog of this polynomial argument that I gave at the beginning. Explaining why it's uh, um, yeah so you know I mean so polynomials are things where you differentiate your d times you you you, you get zero um, and the, the analog uh, in scotic setting also course type was where you differentiate d times and there's a way to do that uh, you get a co-boundary uh, rather than zero and so it's it's um, so it's all this, it's all the same except that you have to do with co-boundaries and so you can make sure various co-boundaries talk to each other okay and so and, and this L shape thing does that okay so that, that okay um, that's I think. All I can say without really being <coughs> messy with each other. All right. So why do we care about this? Um, okay. So uh, half a racist thing. So um, so I, I have to say that if you're structured in, in two directions, then you're structured in in, in the sum. Um, there's a dual version of the statement where we sort of take a common complex of everything, even regardless of norms. Um, so there's, there's sort of a dual statement, which I'll state um, informally. Uh, so rather than having a, uh, uh, um, two subgroups, let's take a lot of subgroups. Okay, um, so a dual statement is that you have, a, you have a function which is orthogonal to many of these concatenated spaces. So, um, so that f, uh, let's say, uh, what we might do in Gauss norms. So if you take Gauss norms of state order 2D, um, 2D plus 1, let's say, um, of all the concatenated spaces. So if you take all the subspaces, if the Gauss norms here are small for most i and j, and so I, 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 there are quantifiers which I don't, I don't want to, to describe. Okay. Then you, you can show that the Gauss norm here is small. Um, um, for, uh, for most i. Okay. So, um, 
This tenor is saying that you're, you're orthogonal to pretty much all of these Cantonian spaces, which means that you're, you're orthogonal to some intersection of, of many, many pair of these spaces. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's some Cauchy Schwartz lacking, uh, which, is, which is not difficult. Um, but um, that if you have a whole bunch of, of subspaces of Hilbert space and you're orthogonal to a lot of intersections, then you're actually pretty much orthogonal to, to, to a lot of, of the spaces uh, themselves. So it's actually similar to the Cauchy Schwartz that goes in the kitchen. Yeah, but anyway. Um, it's, uh, um, okay, so, so the, 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 there's some simple Cauchy Schwartz argument that lets you derive this statement from the uh, um, uh, from the uh, um, um, the statement. So, so the way I like to think about it is that if you have a big group and you have, you have all these subgroups, and if you're already Gauss uniform uh, in, the, in the global sense, uh, the Gauss norm sorry, the, 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 the joint action is, is small, then in most of the directions, uh, the Gauss norm uh, in, in the local directions will be small. So you know, the, it, I think the previous results like this for ergodicity, like if you, you have a God expect a big group action, then you often sort of God expect a lot, a lot of the subgroup and this sort of a higher order version of that statement. Um, so basically, you can control sort of these local Gauss norms on at least on, on average um, by a global Gauss norm. Okay, so now I can tell you why we care about this. So, um, so we were interested in counting polynomial patterns in the primes. Okay, so uh, a, a typical example of a pattern we care about is something like this. Okay, so uh, we want, we're interested in finding uh, triples of home n n plus r squared n plus 2 r squared, which are all prime. So basically, what you more quantitatively, you're interested in understanding um, something like this is the Mangle function. Um, and you sum, let's say, n uh, in, in the capital N. Um, and r, um, the natural scale, uh, as it turns out, um, r should be in touch about root n. So that everybody has about the same size. Um, so uh, you, you can make r smaller, and of course, and if you work ergodic theoretically, that's like taking r to be sort of almost bounded in size. But uh, if you want asymptotics, you actually need quite a big r. Um, so it turns out because uh, our number theory can only control primes in very big intervals, not in small intervals. Um, so you want to understand this expression. So uh, it is known that for this particular pattern that there are infinitely many primes, triples of primes of this form. This was done by Cami and I uh, about 10 years ago. No, okay, eight years ago. So okay, but um, okay, uh, yeah, we, we get a lower bound for this because um, we use this, this transverse machinery of, of Ben and myself. That you know, you, this function is unbounded, but, but you can you can modify it. So you can replace it by a bounded function of positive density, and then you can apply um, uh, with sort of Berkus and, 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 and Leibniz to get a lower bound of this particular average. Uh, that's modulus of a bunch of cheating. That's a W trick involved, but okay, um, but. Uh, Okay, so we can get a lower bound, but what we couldn't get at the time were asymptotics, the correct asymptotics. Um, so for linear patterns, more like without the square here, yeah. um, this was done by Ben and I a bit later, um, you know, if you use the inverse Gauss uh, 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 projection of machinery, as we saw actually in earlier's talk, you can get asymptotics for the linear version of these things by, you know, use the fact that, that this function doesn't correlate much of the linear sequence, but once, again, you have this W trick at the first two order. Um, which means that it's, it's, it's Gauss uniform in a certain norm, and then that, that controls this expression. Okay, so you can try to adapt the same sort of machinery to, uh, to handle this polynomial average. So um, the first step is to understand, so whenever you have an average like this, um, the first step is to understand what norms control this average. So would you like to say that if, say, f2 and f3 are bounded, you like to control f1 by some norm. Uh, that you, you like this expression to be controlled by, by some norm of that one. Um, and you can, you can do this, you, you, you do van der Korpert correctly, you do, the, you do this pet induction uh, in general. Actually, this pet is not, doesn't you know, don't have to do that much induction, but okay, but eventually, um, what you find, so what would be ideal is that uh, if you could control this expression by a global Gauss norm, so you know, u10 of, of your whole interval, so you, you average over all parallel, parallel packets of 10 dimensions over this interval size n. If you could do something like this, um, then you're combining that with the machinery of uh, the transmission that we, and all the stuff in the previous paper of Tammy, you could eventually get asymptotic for this price if you could control things like a global Gauss norm. Um, but you don't get that immediately. If, if you do your van der Korpen and so forth, uh, what you get instead of something like this is something that looks more like um, an oversimplification. Uh, 
um, you get a whole bunch of average local Galois norms. Um, so you get something like, so, so um, going from 1 to n, uh, you have to pick a, a shift, which, which you can take to be the maximal size of size by root n, and then you, you have a progression of spacing h and size by root n. So it, 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 it fills out pretty much the entire, um, uh, the entire interval, but it's very sparse. And you only take Galois norms uh, along the sort of sub, so I think this is like a subgroup of, 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 of n. So this is a very sparse subgroup, it's really a subprogression, subgroup. And you take local Galois norm along only this, this direction, which is, which is analogous to taking um, just a local Galois norm along just a, a, a sub, like, a, like say a vertical horizontal subgroup of, of the original group. And so you have all these local Galois norms, and, uh, and then you average them together all h. So you have sort of fairly dense looking question of progression to average them together. And this many races in power is the type of thing that controls this norm if you do all the Van der Korpen stuff. And so you need this to be small. Um, and so you need an inverse theorem for, for, for this funny average norm. And we don't have that. Uh, we only have an average in, in, in the system for the big global norm. Um, if you do think, so the, the, the normal ergodic, uh, when you do ergodic theory um, kind of to, 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 to find that in the form, you don't see this so much because you don't take R to be this, uh, to be quite this big. You take R to, be, to, be, to just be almost in a valid set. Um, and so you do have many, many norms, but, but, uh, but then this H is just, is just uh, much, much shorter. And all these norms are basically uh, comparable to each other once H is bounded. And so you really only have one norm uh, in, the, in the ergodic theory world. Um, but uh, we can't use that um, because uh, for, for, for primes, because then you, you, you only have, um, uh, your, your, your local Galois norm is very short. It's, it's, it's stuck in an interval size root n. And you need to understand things like how many primes there are in interval size root n. Um, and actually, you need to do some worse than that to answer how the primes correlate with your sequences in interval size root n. And we don't have that, those results from number theory yet. Um, and so, um, if, you try, if, you try, if you try things sort of in the, um, using sort of the, the ergodic theory approach, you don't see these averages, but, but then you arrive at something that, that, that number theorists can't estimate. Um, and so, the only thing that number theorists can control is, 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 is how the primes correlate on, on big, long intervals. Um, so, you really need to somehow control this somehow by a Gauss norm of a much higher order along the global direction, because these guys we can control, uh, because we have an inverse theorem that, that controls this by coalition uh, with no sequences on a big interval, and we can control how the primes are distributed, how they coalesce as no sequences on really big intervals. Um, and this concatenation theorem, uh, so there's a common Hoyle version of, the, of this theorem, which allows you to control this by some function. That if this is small, then the average of these ones are small. Uh, basically because most, when you pick two different um, H's and you can take these two progressions, normally when you sum them together, you get a nice positive density subset of, 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 the, of the whole of space. So by using this particular theorem, you, you can control these local norms by these global norms. And then by, by putting all that into a previous theory, you can actually start getting asymptotics. So this, this was a, a motivation. Uh, but this, 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 but um, you know, I, I think these results are kind of nice even without the motivation. Yeah, I mean, they, they, uh, you know, they, they, uh, uh, they sort of describe, they, they capture this, this very intuitive fact about how polynomial structures interact with each other. Okay, so I think uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. There are questions? Can I? So yeah. this same thing can work because you can sort of general multi-dimensional businesses and primes with uh, polynomial patterns? Oh, uh, he, uh, Tammy says yes. Uh, um, yeah, um, yeah, but, uh, probably. Uh, there's, like, uh, there's, there's all these details to check. Uh, yeah. For example, we have to extend the Gauss endos theorem to, to CD actions, which should be true, so we, did, we didn't write it that way. Um, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, if, 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 you, if you have the right range of things. Um, oh, and there's one other condition I know we, we mentioned. Yeah, so we, we can't quite handle arbitrary polynomials. So, so, so this pattern we can handle. But um, this, not annoyingly, uh, we still can't get asymptotic for, for, for this pattern, so even back in one dimension. Um, because uh, the, the problem is that, uh, is that these two guys are too close to each other. Um, so you can't control this by, by well, actually, Tabby claims she can do this. But, um, the, um, when, um, if you do the Van der Kolben and so forth, um, 
for F3, uh, you can still control this expression by global norm in F3 because all, this, this guy is really far away from these two guys. But, you can, but not uh, for F1, F2, East, only the local norm. These guys are so much too close to each other. Um, so there are these technical conditions, and in higher dim um, dimensions, uh, stating what the technical condition is is going to be quite messy. Okay? In one dimension, uh, uh, the, the condition is that the highest order of the will be distinct than we will. Yeah, so but, yeah, in principle, higher dimensional uh, analogs should be possible. Um, it's not known in general. Uh, you know, so, okay, so, so for Z actions and ZK actions, there's a whole scrap theory. For, um, for, groups of, for groups of finite characteristic, um, Vitaly, Vitaly, and I have a description of the Gaxi factors. Um, but then in general, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly. No, I mean, so you know, the theory of other actions that works says something. Um, yeah. And then if you, have, if, you, if you work with these more general commuting shifts that I mentioned briefly, yeah, then, then there's, there's only a very partial description. Right? Tim Orson has always papers giving some description, but not a very tractable one. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of a mystery what, what exactly these, these, these factors are. So I mean, one nice thing about this, this uh, algorithm is that they're soft, actually. We don't, don't actually need to classify um, these spaces in order to, to give our theorems. Yeah. Like we're hoping that maybe we could use this machine to actually start proving, uh, giving our turn proof of some of these numbers. Yeah. It's a dream. Right. Can you give me one of these examples where you're one step and one horizontal and one in the vertical? Is there a direction where you're already seeing two steps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, in that example, any other direction would be two steps. So all of the directions are two steps? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. So you can only have two directions which are. In that example, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, I, I can imagine like if you have a two-step system of Z two, then in most directions it should still be two-step. I mean, it, it's rare that you just don't get a cancellation in the highest order. Yeah, two. Two. I don't know. So this is diagonal contribution of I, I equals J, which is never small. Um, uh, and so, you know, the, so the condition still becomes vacuous if, if K is too small, or, or trivial if K is too small. Um, um, OK, yeah, so, 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 um, yeah, so when I say for most, yeah, so if K is really small, what you need is if this is small for all I and J, then this is small for all I. So that's a true statement. But it's, it's trivial because if you for all I and J, it's also a diagonal case I equals J. Um, and if for i equals j, this norm is already stronger than, 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 than this norm here. So it, um, this thing theorem doesn't have much content for k small. Um, just yeah, the, because of the annoying diagonal shift. But for k large, the diagonal shift doesn't matter. Okay, so there's no, there's no nice Gauss norm statement directly dual to the uh, well, well the, the, the sort of by general principles that there is one. But I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's sort of one that I, um, it's almost one that I said. But, uh, yeah, but, but as far as as as, as, as dual results that you can actually use, um, you can have some sort of large K to, to, to give it a diagonal. So I have a sort of a conclusion of this, this sort of this question and this sort of principle. Mm -hmm. Suppose this is from my test that just came up at a, a conference a couple of months ago, a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. It says something like this. Suppose I, 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 cor I fail to correlate with all polynomials of some very large degree in R2 but restrict the long line. Mm -hmm. So if I restrict the lines and I don't correlate with any polynomial to degree 100, can you say anything about my correlation uh, over the, all of R2 with polynomials to say degree 2? Or degree 1? Or degree 2? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we do. We, it, we do. I was out goes in the opposite direction. I mean, if you don't correlate polynomials in any line, they're just Fugini. Uh, you don't Sorry, other way around. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, yeah so, Right, yeah, so um, we didn't actually write it this way, but probably there's, there's a, a list for that, that if you have a, 
uh, but you need these null sequences. <laughs> yeah, if you have a function say R2, which doesn't call it any null sequence of level of degree 100, then along most lines, it should, it should not call it with proof, say, with, uh, with, it should have small Fourier coefficients, for instance. We should sum us up like that, uh, which we haven't worked out. Um, yeah, but something like this is possible. But um, you probably will have to um, drag in the, the null sequence machinery. You, you can't sort of 